please allow me, allow me to paint the picture of a fast-paced, greed-struck, independence-driven, cold-hearted world, each man for himself, time ticking bomb, tick-tock, tick-tock. Hey, what's the rush? The ties that bind our human spirits, the extension of unseen arms, the brother's keeper, the support of a sister, like the stretched out legs of a three-legged port, have we lost it? Soldiers of ants gather, bees share the hive, the birds flock together, the constellation runs like a well-oiled machine, can we meet in such a place? A place of fraternity and unity. A place where we sing of interdependence over individuality. A place where togetherness is the norm. A place where I see you for you and you see me for me. Where we put our differences aside. Kimu Tukabatu. I am because you are. I am because we are. So can we repaint the picture? From discrimination, hate, and war, to love, peace, and harmony. Because umuntu ngumuntu ngabantu. That was a poem by Golden Ij from South Africa. Um, this talk today is brought to you by Neocropolis. Uh, branches in South Africa and Chicago. New Acropolis is an international NGO um, in, in over 60 plus countries in the world. New Acropolis is a school of practical philosophy um, and aims to make the teachings of the great philosophers and cultures that came before us accessible to all. So some of you might know that on Thursday it was World Philosophy Day and every year the centers of New Acropolis around the world respond to the call of UNESCO to celebrate World Philosophy Day. UNESCO established World Philosophy Day stating that philosophy is a discipline that encourages critical and independent thought, creating a better understanding of the world and promoting tolerance and peace. And that's why we are having this event today. Okay, so let's kick it off with our first speaker. Our first speaker's name is Gilad Sommer. He's a philosopher and a writer. He's also the director of Neocropolis Chicago. He's the founder of the Israeli Tristan Institute of Performance Art. He's a published author and his book, Above All Be Good, about stoicism came out in 2020. So here's Gilad speaking about individualism. So um, today our main topic is actually Ubuntu. But before we talk about Ubuntu, about the process from me to we, I want to sort of uh, diagnose or look at the issues that uh, compels us to think about this uh, idea of Ubuntu. And I want to talk about a trend that has been going on in the last, I would say, 50 years in the West and accelerating, especially in the last 20 years, which is something I call hyper individualism which is a process that really brings us from we to me. So today will be a little bit like a, a doctor philosopher who is diagnosing a problem and Rihanna afterward will present us with a possible antidote or a solution. So uh, in 2000, a book came out uh, by a professor of Harvard, uh, Robert D. Putnam called Bowling Alone. Putnam was a league bowler in his youth, and he noticed that people stopped playing bowling in leagues. They still played bowling by themselves or with one or two friends, but leagues of bowling are starting, were starting to get smaller and smaller. And he wanted to see if this phenomenon also takes place in other areas of life, of social life. And his conclusion in this book was that what he called social capital has been decreasing since the 1960s. And what does it mean by social capital? So here are some examples. So for example, 
some things he mentions. Lower confidence in local government and media. Less, less expectation that others will cooperate to solve dilemmas of collective action. Less likelihood of working a community project. Less likelihood of giving to charity or volunteering. And if volunteering, doing it alone. Fewer close friends and confidence. More time spent watching television, right? And in total, or in a general trend, less happiness and less perceived quality of life. Now, this is interesting because this book was written in 2000, so about 20 years ago, before social media, before iPhones, before iPads and all this stuff. So it's an interesting reflection for us. And if you want, you can write it in the chat what your reflection is. Whether we think this trend actually continued, that means it got worse during the last 20 years, or actually it's, it's gotten better in the last 20 years with the appearance of social media and so on. An interesting reflection. Another uh, interesting source that we find is a book written by uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He was the chief rabbi of um, the UK. And in 2009, he wrote a book called The Home We Build Together. And in this book, he spoke about something called the hotel society. And he compared the way of life in the Western world today to a hotel, to living in a hotel. What does that mean? Each one of us is sort of in our own rooms and we, we live our own sort of separate lives in our own rooms and we pay the bills in the form of taxes once a year and we expect the management of the hotel to take care of everything related to the hotel, cleaning, maintenance and all that. Um, and we sort of live our lives and if no one is bothering us from the other rooms in the hotel, we're good. So this is sort of this general idea of, of um, the hotel society. But what uh, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is pointing out is that while this may sound idyllic to some people, okay, I don't bother anybody, nobody bothers me, I don't need to worry about anything, I just pay the taxes and so on. Eventually, a hotel is not a home. It doesn't matter how fun, fancy it is, yeah, because we can say some of us live in hotels, some of us live in motels. Doesn't matter what kind of what how fancy it is or how big it is. A hotel is never a home. We always feel like we're guests, right? And in the, in these kind of societies that we have, everybody is a guest. So, um, what does it mean that we're a guest? It means that we feel that we don't belong. So I want to introduce this concept that sort of relates these two ideas, to, ideas together, which is hyper-individualism. And I want to introduce it with a quote uh, by philosopher Jorge Livraga, the founder of Neocropolis. The excess of individualism is as bad as the lack of it. And this is interesting because usually what we're worried about is the lack of individualism, the lack of individual freedom, the lack of our ability to live as individuals. But everything to excess is not good, right? So in this case, I'm talking about a case where individualism is taken to the extreme. And in, now, I don't mean to say that individualism in, in general is a bad thing. On the opposite, we need individualism. But there is something that is called healthy individualism. What do I mean by healthy individualism? When we have healthy individualism, we recognize some things, some principles. One of them is that the individual should not be a mere means for the service of society. That means the individual is not just a tool just a means to, to help pr promote some goal that society has. This is actually something that we find today maybe in some corporations, in business corporations, where um, the person is not an individual, is not really considered as a human being or an individual, 
but they're just something to be used in order to make profit or to produce products and so on. Which is very interesting. I find that it's ironic that at the heart of our very individualistic society, we have this extremely collectivistic uh, organizations. Yeah, but this is sometimes something we see in uh, in some corporations. Within healthy individualism, the individual qualities, the talents, the inclinations, the human spirit, the human dignity is taken into account. Yeah, we cannot just ignore the individual, erase the individual to serve society. In healthy individualism, the liberty of the individual is very important. Every person has the right to take part in society, regardless of their external characteristics, whether it's race, gender, etc. This is the liberty. That means that every person needs to have what we call today equal opportunities. Every person should have the chance to take part, to participate, to contribute. Oh, going back to that slide. So the, the symbol I chose for this healthy individualism is this um, musician in an orchestra. Why? Because this is a very interesting idea, the idea of an orchestra, because in an orchestra, every player, every mu musician plays their own instrument that they chose and tries to make the best that they can to contribute to, to the goal of the orchestra. Um, every, uh, every musician needs to train to improve themselves, to perfect themselves, and they have an important contribution to the whole. Yeah, they are part of a whole, but they don't lose their individuality within it. And in that sense, that's healthy individualism. And at the same time, if every musician in the orchestra will start playing whatever they want, that's also not going to be healthy individualism. That's going to be cacophony. It's going to be a lot of noise. And that's what we call actually hyper individualism. In hyper-individualism, we have this sort of extreme look, extreme view of individualism, where there is a belief that the needs, or even I would say the desires of each person are more important than the desires of the whole group. The Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius said, nothing that is bad for the beehive can be good for the bee. But sometimes we, we act in a way that we think that it doesn't matter what happens to the whole as long as I'm okay. And it's a little bit like this image that you have here on the right, where everybody is trying to just save themselves and build their own boats, their own little boats out of the big boat. But what we don't take in account is that when it's a rough sea, when there's a storm, we have much more chance to survive and to navigate the storm in a big ship than in one small boat, right? Um, in the hyper-individual, we also have this idea of the self, the self-made man, this idea of the individual doesn't need anybody, I don't need anybody, I don't have responsibilities towards anybody, it's just me on desert island taking care of myself. And this is related to this idea of individual freedom, which is not exactly the same as individual liberty. In our modern idea of freedom, we have this idea of freedom means to do what I want wherever and whenever I want it, which is not only not realistic, it's unrealistic because obviously there are limitations, natural limitations that prevent us from doing everything we want wherever and whenever we want it, but also with this kind of idea of freedom, it's, um, this, uh, this idea of freedom creates a very dangerous situation for the whole, yeah? Imagine a cell in our body says, saying that, I'll do whatever I want, whenever I want. What happens then? We call that cancer, we call that disease. So there is somewhere a middle way that we need to find between this sort of um, extreme freedom and um, liberty. Now, some causes, in my opinion, some ideas that I have about um, what are the causes of hyper-individualism. So one thing is 
what we can call attention mining technologies. I would say that the first attention mining technology is the television or maybe even the book in some way. But the television, I think, is, is the really pure attention mining technology. And then in time, go, as time goes on, these attention mining technologies have become more sophisticated. And now we have it in the form of social media and all these different uh, electronic devices. And what they do is that they take our attention from the world in, in a very, very, very sophisticated way that is very also planned and intentional. And here I have a quote from Gia Talentino, who's a writer for a, The New Yorker. And she says, um, Facebook, like most other forms of social media, runs on double speak, advertising connection, but creating isolation, promoting happiness, but inculcating dread. So a lot of times, what she means to say, I think, is that a lot of times the social media says, yes, we're connecting people together, right? But many times they're actually isolating us in our own sort of physical space and not helping us to create real connections because we can ask that question. Are the connections we create in Facebook and social media in general a real connection or not? And there is the question that comes up here, which again, I invite you to reflect. And if you want to add your comments to the chat, you're welcome to do so. Is social media really social or is it anti-social? So, and what I mean is not by, I don't mean that in a sort of um, ideological sense or romantic sense. What I mean by social or anti-social is simply, is it strengthening the bonds of our communities, strengthening the bonds that the society relies on or is it weakening the bonds of our communities and the, and the bonds that society relies on now of course this is not a black and white answer not a yes no answer it could be doing both in some way but where where does the emphasis lie where does is it more social or more anti-social a reflection another cause of hyper individualism or something that goes very well, I would say, with hyper individualism is consumerism. So, consumer culture and individualism go very well together because, in a way, the less we share, the more we consume, right? So, if let's say five people live in a house, in the same house, and share the same fridge, the same stove, the same uh, equipment and so on, they need to buy less. But if every person lives separately, each one of them needs their own individual fridge, stove, micro, and so on. So naturally, um, consumer culture promotes this individualism because in some way it wants us to be separate and it wants us everyone to have their own thing. And this also creates a, a vicious circle because the more comfortable I become with my sort of sp very specific tastes, the more difficult it becomes for me to live with other people. So in this picture, you see on the right, a, a common sort of, uh, let's say a shelf of cereals you'll find in a, in a common supermarket in the US. And this is only a part because it's endless. Yeah, you will see many, 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 many different uh, different cereal boxes and this variety we can say wow it's positive we can choose whatever we want but there is also a hidden problem in this because when we are becoming very very selective with our taste so let's say i want my roasted flakes with nuts and maple syrup and my friend likes is uh, frosties with uh, nuts but not with maple syrup with honey then when we're going let's say to live together it's going to be very difficult for us to agree on which cereal to buy and to and to eat yeah of course this is an exaggeration but the idea is that when we have this specific taste then it's very hard for us to compromise because i want this very very specific thing that i really really like and the other person so we are sort of nourishing our differences. Another cause of hyper-individualism is what I would call the psychological self. 
for the psychological self, well-being is the most important thing. And that's actually not too bad, but what we understand by well-being, that's the thing here, because usually when we think about well-being, what we understand is feeling good. To have well-being is to feel good. And feeling good is not the same as to be good. To be good and to feel good is not the same, right? So um, eating, I may, I may feel good eating now a box of donuts, but it's not necessarily going to be good for me, right? <laughs> so not all the time feeling good and being good are the same thing. And if we're always looking for that feel-good sensation, then we're going to, first of all, um, sometimes avoid what is really good for us. And sometimes we're also going to um, avoid going on paths that are actually good for our growth, good for our progress, good for us as human beings. Because sometimes the paths that are good for us as human beings that lead to growth don't feel so good. They actually feel difficult. They actually feel that we're challenging ourselves, that we're facing our inner dragons, that we're facing our fears, our doubts. And that doesn't always feel good, right? And another idea here is that what feels good is more important than the greater good. So it's not about thinking what's good for everybody. It's about what's good for me right now. And... One last idea or last cause about hyper-individualism is this idea of what I call false freedom, as opposed to the liberty I spoke about before. And this is again connecting to what I said before, this idea of freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I want. And, and then freedom becomes a sort of a goal instead of a means. What do I mean by that? When we speak about freedom, we have to ask ourselves the freedom from what? What are we freeing ourselves from? Am I freeing myself from my virtues, from my good aspects, from my higher aspects? In that case, freedom is not a great thing. Yeah. But if I'm freeing myself from my limitations, that's great. We should ask ourselves to freedom to do what? Freedom what am I going to do with that freedom? Okay, I have freedom, but what am I going to do with that? David Brooks, another New York writer, uh, New York Times writer, in this case, writes, freedom is not an ocean. It is a river to cross to get to the other side, which I find very interesting because usually we imagine freedom as an ocean. It's the goal. I'm getting there and I'm free. But he's saying something interesting that freedom is something we need but it helps us or or when we cross it we use it to get to the other side which is i would say commitment so in that sense freedom and commitment are not opposite but freedom is a tool that allows us to choose our commitments but once we've chosen them okay we have to commit but when freedom becomes a goal then we we are afraid of commitment because then it means, oh, my freedom is going to be limited. So I don't want to commit to anything because in that case, I won't be able to do all the other things that I didn't commit to, right? But when we use our freedom wisely and we choose our commitments wisely, um, we actually free in the sense that we're able to uh, live our commitments with consciousness, with happiness, with joy. So I... I spoke about hyper-individualism, um, which is a trend in our society. I spoke about the causes of hyper-individualism. The next question is, what can you do about it? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> By yourself. And this is, again, one of the sort of the stories, the myths of hyper-individualism. It shows us these great heroes, these great figures of history and tells us, oh, these are the people who are changing the world and they're sort of lofty and sort of in, in, in their own islands, disconnected from everybody else. Now, I'm not here to underestimate 
the great figures of history. I think they were exceptional. But I think the real image is of them as the tip of an iceberg, the tip of a mountain, not as someone who is disconnected, who just does everything by themselves, and sort of the great leader who has no, who is by themselves and, and does everything by themselves, but as leaders or part of a bigger movement. I think that this is another um, sort of myth of our hyper-individualistic society that we can change the world by ourselves. I don't think that's possible. So what we can do is to take part, to belong, to find a way uh, to, to be part of something, uh, to take small in our, uh, responsibilities in our community, to commit to some larger cause, to join a choir, an orchestra, some existing society that already works to, for a higher cause, for a larger cause, a community, etc. In other words, to find our place. Well, this is just in a few words because Rihanna is going to give us more um, details about the solution, but I also wanted to offer some ideas. So thank you for listening. That's it for me for today. And I pass the mic to Rihanna. Thanks, Gilad. That is a really good presentation. I, there was so much detail in there. Um, one of the concepts that really stuck out for me was freedom is not a notion, it's a river to cross and commitments on the other side. Um, it really shifts the paradigm or my, my own personal paradigm. Um, I'm loving the conversations that are happening inside the chat as well. So keep that conversation going. And remember, if you want, want to ask any questions, please also drop it in there. And now for our next speaker, our next speaker is Rihanna Peck, who's gonna be speaking to us about Ubuntu. I just, just a bit of background about Rihanna is she's a philosopher, she's a teacher at Neocropolis South Africa and a learning material developer. And over to Rihanna, who's gonna to speak to us about Ubuntu. So Ubuntu, when we translate this phrase, we consider that I am an individual because we are all individuals. I am because you are a part of <clears throat> the society and together we create this society. So our humanity is intricately related to each other. In that sense, we need to go from me to we and back again to me, it's a circle. Ubu means oneness and humanity, the ability to be humane. And Ntu means wholeness. That is the individual becoming whole and healthy as Gilad pointed out. When we consider um, how we can process Ubuntu or become a part of the process of Ubuntu, the element of contribution does come into play. And I'd like you to see the pictures on the right-hand side for our city, inner city beautification project that we took in 2018. It was a lonely wall with a few scribbles until someone imagined that it should be a home for Ubuntu. We used the rainbow colors because in South Africa, we have the a saying that we are the rainbow nation. <clears throat> and this was part of um, an identity building and nation building project that we took after apartheid. What I have here then is a collection of Andrinka symbols and they are said to have originated from Ghana. These symbols relate the history and the beliefs of the Asante people. It is said that <clears throat> these, every symbol is a, an aspect of wisdom and it is considered um, a value to be wise in society and to bring your wisdom to contribute to society. In that sense, we start to create 
a healthy idea of the true individual and how the true individual can be a part of creating this just, good, and beautiful society. The concept of humanistic existentialism was started in the Renaissance, which we all know to be um, the definition of rebirth. To be human means to express, express your human consciousness. And this human consciousness is intricately related to the meaning you create in your life and the meaning we create together. In this sense, we cannot divide humanism and existentialism. They are so intricately related, they are in sync. So what are some of these humanistic characteristics that we should be considering for ourselves as we are building our healthy individuality? Human dignity, wholeness, social responsibility, generosity, peace, sustainability, and much, much more. Let us consider some obstacles to Ubuntu. The first one, and the most important one, um, was termed psychological claustrophobia in a journal of humanistic psychology. And simply put, it means that we are mentally and emotionally isolated, as Gilad pointed out. Here I have the story of a photographer, Kevin Carter, who won the Pulitzer Prize for feature photography in 1994. A little background about Kevin Carter. He was a photographer who diarized or <clears throat> uh, took photographs of the apartheid uh, atrocities here in South Africa during, during the struggle of um, for freedom, if you will, for our country. You can find out a little bit more about them in the movie called The Bang Bang Club. And this image was called The Struggling Girl, which describes a famished child who was a mere kilometers away from a UN rescue camp in Southern Sudan. And if anybody's aware of the situation that took place at that time, there was um, a mass genocide uh, between the Hutu and the Tutsi um, uh, clans or tribes, pardon me. Uh, something that Kevin Carter said, I'm really sorry. The pain of life overrides the joy. I am haunted by the vivid memories of killings and corpses and anger and pain, of starving and wounded children, of trigger happy madmen, often police, killer executioners. Unfortunately, Kevin Carter became a drug addict and eventually took his life. And in my opinion, it was probably due to this psychological claustrophobia. Having witnessed all these atrocities, he struggled to find his own humanity. He struggled to connect with his own humanity during that difficult time in apartheid. And this is something we can ask ourselves when we are going through a difficult time. Does it build my individuality or do I isolate myself psychologically? In this journal of humanistic psychology, <clears throat> um, they proposed five core tenets of uh, Ubuntu. And the first one being holism. What does this mean? I'd like us to consider the idea of the circle. The human being is personally integrated from the center of the circle. As the circle grows, the human being connects with the environment, connects with society. And then there exists a uh, coexistent relationship between the individual, all the people in the social circle, and every activity that they take part in in the community. Essentially, it is up to the individual to create harmony 
within all of these circles. How can we do that? It's personal. In that sense, we then need self-awareness and a sense of social responsibility. As in the case of Kevin Carter, he missed this interconnectedness of himself with society. And that's exactly what he needed, perhaps to take him out of the psychological claustrophobia. Third, we have generosity, sharing, and team spirit. In South Africa, we have an interesting concept called tax, and we would call it black tax for not wanting to offend anyone. But this idea became negative, but it is originally a positive contribution to your family. The idea is that when someone in the family is ready to go to university and one comes from a, a poorer community or family, the entire family of, of, of extended aunts and uncles and so forth would then come together to raise the financial needs for the child to go to university. This then becomes a feedback loop. If the child then completes their degree and then find a job, it will be incumbent upon them to pay it forward in that exact manner for their own nieces or nephews or cousins. So this generosity and sharing and team uh, spirit also happens in uh, for bosses in uh, who have employees who are poorer, you hear of um, domestic, domestic workers whose children are sent to school, private schools by their employers. And there are many stories like this. Now, as Gilad said, the question is, at what point do you choose to participate then in this sharing and team spirit through generosity? The opportunity is there. Then it takes us to a larger so, uh, circle for social justice and human rights. And essentially we can consider this to be how are our values and principles seen in action? Do we act on them? Because when we share and help each other, the whole community can thrive through this sharing. And this is very, a very key concept in African society. And finally, spirituality. So spirituality is usually termed as, or in a broader context, we can see it as the ability to find meaning in our lives. Now, how is the spiritual? Once we find meaning, or more importantly, start to create meaning, one spirit is uplifted just by definition of that meaning. At the same time, all spirituality re revolves around a sense of connectedness, unity. The circle must be complete. It is whole. And a circle also requires there to be many points many parts, many degrees, if we use a mathematical term. Now, in the spirit of the African oral tradition, <clears throat> I'd like to share a little anecdote about um, this image I have for you. I found this, I came across this image a few years ago in Facebook under the heading Ubuntu. And it, it read that, in certain regions of South Africa, when someone does something wrong, he is taken to the center of the village and surrounded by the tribe for two days. Here they speak of all the good he has done. And this they believe is because they believe that each person is good, yet we all make mistakes. This is really a cry for help. They unite in this ritual to encourage the person to reconnect with his true nature. 
the belief is that unity and affirmation have more power to change behavior than shame and punishment. This is known as Ubuntu. Now, because this is a Facebook post, I cannot confirm or deny <laughs> its truth. <laughs> but I wanted to share this story because at the time of viewing it, <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> I felt a strong connection or sense of Ubuntu when I read this post because my heart was touched. And in essence, this is what we all need to try to grasp about Ubuntu. It is about the heart being activated when we connect to other people. So the question is, do you have Ubuntu? Do you create it? How can you then bring to life these ideas if your heart is not in it, in your connections, in your relationships, in your deeds and actions, in your values and principles? Then we have this beautiful picture and it is just known as an African proverb because that's the tradition of African storytelling. One does not know the author because the individual is not as important as the collective. What is important that the story is told and carried forward to the next generation so that the next generation can learn and become a part of the story in their own way. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Here we have some <clears throat> experiences of Ubuntu on a larger scale. The first is what we would call in South Africa, a tribal in Daba, which is a meeting that would take place in a community or in a village. There would be a facilitator or a chairman who opens up the in Daba or meeting and presents a problem or organizes an event. Now, if it's a problem, every single person is in the community is invited to partake meaning that each voice counts. The Indaba will not end until everyone has spoken and has been heard. The Indaba is, if it's meant to find a solution, they will not end the Indaba unless there is a consensus. Now, this is very interesting because in the West, time is considered precious. So the quicker we can get to a solution, the better. But in this, spirit, we want everybody to feel comfortable to contribute. That means we get their buy-in. <clears throat> then perhaps you have heard of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which took place in 1996. This was after the fall of apartheid and um, Nelson Mandela was instated as the first black president or democratically elected president of South Africa. And the entire aim of this TRC or Truth and Reconciliation Commission was literally to allow both the perpetrators and the victims of apartheid to tell their stories. It was an indaba. Everyone could be heard and the perpetrators could apply for amnesty, provided that they met certain conditions. It wasn't a blanket statement. Now, why reconciliation and not retribution? The one victim expressed <clears throat> because of having lost loved ones to the, the struggle, we would like to forgive we just want to know who to forgive. So, <clears throat> in 
in trying to rebuild the nation of South Africa, this rainbow nation, this colorful place with many different tribes, many different languages, and <clears throat> a sense of healthy individuality, we needed this renaissance. We needed the ability to remove the old narrative, but first it had to be heard. Only once it was heard and expressed, could we then look really look at unity and Ubuntu. Now I'd like to share with you some ideas <clears throat> of the modern versions of Ubuntu. Essentially, we can understand that <clears throat> every society would like to build a unified community, a unified story, a unified sense of belonging. So as <clears throat> Gilad said, if we want to go from me to we, we first need to self-transcend. This is Abraham Maslow's final um, aspect in the hierarchy of needs. And what he wrote about this idea is that, I quote, transcendence refers to the very highest and most inclusive or holistic levels of human consciousness, behaving and relating as ends rather than means to oneself, to significant others, to human beings in general, to other species, to nature and to the cosmos. Now you can see that it's vital for one to create one's individuality and then give that gift of individuality to the community, to the world, to your relationships. Another idea is the idea of spiritual intelligence, which is a book written by um, Dana Zoha. And she described 12 principles that create spiritual intelligence, four of which are essentially based on Ubuntu. Number one, the ability to celebrate all of our diversity. If we can regard others as valuable due to their differences, we are now creating Ubuntu. Of course, compassion is needed in order to build this. The sense of vocation, we can consider to be, do we call ourselves to serve and give something back through our work, through our hobbies, <clears throat> through every aspect of our lives in order to create meaning every day. And of course, holism. Dana describes holism as seeing larger patterns, relationships, connections. It's the archetype of the musician. Do, does one see these broad patterns and values and relationships? and have a sense of belonging. This ability to both zoom in, zoom out and zoom in to make all these patterns and relationships relevant to us, as well as valuable to the community. <clears throat> then once we build our individuality and perhaps while we build our individuality, we are called to for civil engagement, to be a part of the current status quo, or perhaps changing the narrative of the current status quo in society. And this means we need to take part. No matter how small the role is, if you do it consciously, you can add value, you can be a part of the human story. And finally, <clears throat> we, I'd like you to have a look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If we look at the goals two to five, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education and gender equality, notice how every single person can 
create this goal and take part in it or help it to come into existence, if you will. 12 to 15, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land. The same is said of the individual. We, every single action we take can contribute to the achievement of these goals. But the question is, alone, it seems like a drop in the ocean. Together, now we have a larger imprint, a larger range of effectivity. And this, in my opinion, is the true sense of Ubuntu. Because <clears throat> when I understand that my littering, my, um, my, the way I treat other people of a different gender, how I communicate in a non-violent manner is how I create the peace within the society, is how I realize that my reaction in society builds it, no matter how small that reaction is or action or value. And if we look at <clears throat> goal number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, is this call to action to be a part of something important. Incumbent in Ubuntu, we need to realize that this is a need of the soul. The soul is hungry to participate in healthy, holistic, valuable contributions to society. Can we do this? Do we answer the call? Now, <clears throat> I invite you to have a look at these images. Um, for me, once again, they inspired a sense of Ubuntu. And it is said that a person can have more or less Ubuntu in proportion to his conduct towards his fellow mankind, making himself more or less a genuine human being. This is the drive of Ubuntu, to become more or less genuinely human in unity with others. This is the active nature of Ubuntu. It's a process. It's a goal at the end of the tunnel, but we have to walk through the tunnel by contributing in order to complete the circle. Have a look at these two pictures courtesy of um, NASA and the Hubble telescope, I think it's called, forgive me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the picture on the right is by Edgar Mitchell, who uh, went on Apollo 14 in 1971. And he describes a sense of ecstatic euphoria that he experienced when he returned back from the moon, having seen this image, the horizon of both the earth, this wasn't the exact image, but the horizon of both the earth and the sun and the moon. So three, the three all together. He said that I realized that the matter in our universe were generated in ancient stars. I had the recognition that we are all part of the same stuff. We are all one. Wow. Those are my stars. My body is connected to those stars. It was a full whole body experience. When he returned to earth, he researched and asked many of his colleagues what had happened to him. And the answer that came back to him was samadhi or the, a Sanskrit word, which means seeing things separated and united at the same time and accompanied with ecstasy. He says that he was transformed by this experience and he became a peacekeeper immediately. Interestingly enough, 
all cultures have a reference for this experience, but it starts with a larger perspective or an overview effect. In this sense, he transcended, he had an experience of transcendent human consciousness, if you will, and he was transformed for life. Ubuntu invites us to become transformed on earth through other individuals. While some of us may like to go to Mars or the moon, we don't have to. Any other individual within your circle has the ability to give you this overview effect if you are open to it. This is the call. And finally, <clears throat> If the circle of life calls us to join in her dance, how will we make the circle bigger? This is a South African term. <laughs> Perhaps it's only a question of when we will join in. Umuntu, ngumuntu, ngabantu. I am because we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rihanna. That is that I'm still, I think I'm still on slide number three in my mind. Um, that ritual about the positive affirmations was very, very deep. I think a lot of people were also commenting on that. Um, so before we go into our break, I think we'll take a couple of questions for our speakers. So you, anyone wants to speak, you can raise your hand or I didn't see any questions in the chat box. So if you, you're more than welcome to put the question in the chat box if you want, or raise your hands and... No pressing questions. I think Cisco had a question in the chat box. Yeah, okay. hi. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Francisco. Yeah, from uh, New York, Chicago. Um, it was very interesting to see the diagram from the uh, United Nations and all the sustainable goals. Those are uh, very... Um, uh, nice to see it from a global organization. But my question then is like how uh, that I posted in the, in the chat, it's like how clear are these goals to our local government leaders? You know, did they like, did they use this or are we just like, uh, they all purely just focusing on the, on the local th theatrics of the day or, and, and then if they are not aware of this, uh, then how can we remind them? You know, how, how, how can we, you know, do something to like make, I know we can live our lives to, to the simplest ones that it was portrayed there by the presenter. Um, but is there something else that we could do to like bring it up a little higher into the next circle in our society? Thank you, it was wonderful. So Cisco, is that a specific question for North America local government or just a general question? Would you like uh, to- Yeah, if she, if she can do that. Okay, yeah, either one of the two can take it. That'd be great. But I would be glad to uh, hear what you have to say about it. Okay, I'll go for it. Thank you, Cisco. <clears throat> In our experience um, dealing with the Department of Social Development here in South Africa, um, it's like a slow moving elephant, um, unfortunately. And I think that's what you are getting at. Um, and what I've come to understand is that they are relying on NGOs to do a lot of the work because they have a more efficiency without um, that much red tape, although it is a part of the process. Um, that's the quick answer. But more importantly, in the spirit of Ubuntu, we are actually asked to belong, to pick a struggle, and go with it. Um, if you love <clears throat> animals, make sure you are contributing to uh, awareness of, in South Africa, there are many animals that <clears throat> are not neutered, we say is the impolite term. Um, but that, the point that I'm making is your hand in volunteering changes everything because one of the examples I um, actually forgot to mention was, um, 
I cannot recall which country it is, but they have a national volunteering day. Um, Tanzania? Was it Tanzania? I don't think so. Rwanda. Rwanda, Rwanda one of them. And every month, everyone is supposed to volunteer. So isn't this an amazing cause that the government is instating? Now, Ubuntu is saying, why are you waiting for the government to make it, um, let's say, incumbent upon you? Ubuntu says, if you choose to volunteer, you're already changing the narrative. And it's saying, let's change from the grassroots up. Um, yeah, and if you want to start your own organization, why not join an organization instead of starting one? Because um, I can promise you most organizations <laughs> um, are short of volunteers and they already have a framework or a procedure and so forth. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You.